Yeah. Right. Could you okay. just do quick reading? You know, I, I, I did. It kept on popping up, and I think I didn't hit. I didn't bother to hit the OK, and I didn't. Is, is, it, is everything all right, though? Did she just sent me an email and like, why did you submit this on the late? And I was like, good. No, yeah, no, you, no, it wasn't. It wasn't you. It was definitely not. Okay, so why don't we get started? All right, I'm going to take that as a yes. You mean my group still, but they need their names on it when they come in? Um, can you just write their names on? I don't know. I'm trying to type their names. Ah, yeah. okay. All right. Okay, so let's get, let's get started. All right, so what I want to do first so, hmm. here we go. Hmm. Weird. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and look at what was going on in activity three. For some reason, this is not working. Not sure why this isn't. Nope. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to put it in, in slideshow mode. For some reason, that's not working well. I don't know why. So uh, let's just try this. Okay, so what we were trying to do in activity three is we're trying to get the distribution of the sample mean. In other words, we want to know what the plot of the sample means are going to look like. So the way we did this in activity three was we went ahead and we determined our sample size, right? We had different sample sizes, and then we took a thousand samples, right? So this was our population of all past sales. We took one sample maybe of, of four tickets and computed the sample mean, took a second sample of four tickets, computed the sample mean, and so on. And we computed that a thousand times, right? And then what we do is we went ahead and we plotted okay, those, those sample means. And we wanted to try to understand what did that plot look like? So we want to go through this in, in some detail. So first of all, we 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 want to know what this what this thing should look like. Okay, if if the distribution from the sample means kind of looks mild shaped, we'd like to know is that normal, right? So that we can use the uh, empirical rules. We kind of have a little bit of a clue as to what should be going on. We kind of think in our mind that we're taking estimates of the, of the population mean. So if we're doing this correctly, we think that the values of in X bar, the sample mean, should be kind of scattered around, should be kind of centered around the population mean. And intuitively, it makes sense to think that larger sample sizes should have a more narrow distribution. The values should be more concentrated. And finally, we wanted to see how we make decisions. Okay. The whole point of doing this was I wanted to use this distribution of sample mean to look at a new sample mean and ask, does it come from this old population? 
And so on um, uh, activity four, which will be quiz two, you're going to actually do that. You're, you're, you're going to use this um, stuff that we talk about today. There's a couple of facts that we need to kind of understand before we can really get into this. And the first fact is that the sample mean itself is a variable. And that's a kind of notion that's not so obvious because even though when you take a sample, you're kind of used to this notion that each thing you're taking is a variable, when you compute the sample mean, it seems like something is fixed. But the point here is that from sample to sample, that sample means changing. So this was my, this was, th these are my calculations. So we all started off with the same past uh, sales, right, 10,000 uh, sales here. And notice that for the first sample of size four in blue, we got the sample mean that's in blue. And then when I chose the second sample of four tickets, that's the second sample with the two there, I got a second sample mean. So it's important to keep that in mind, even though we're all aware that when we take different samples, we're gonna get different sorts of sample mean, it's important to realize this is a variable. The main reason why that's important is because variables have distributions, right? That's what a variable is, it's not a fixed value. Okay, so we're, there, there's something that we can study here. The second fact that we got out of activity three was that the sample mean has its own distribution. So for example, if you, if you actually plotted the ticket prices in the entire population, okay, I didn't ask you to do that, but some, some of you did this. You didn't notice that this distribution is strong in white skew. That's not too surprising, right? We said a lot of times financial data is really strong in white skew. And actually, the, 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 the book kind of tells you something that's interesting. The book says that if there's a lower limit on one side of the distribution and no limit on the upper side of the distribution, it, it's, it's commonly in white skew. That's usually true, not always. But the, the, the point here I want to make is if you look at the ticket sales, you can see that they're like skew. If you look at the distribution of the sample means when I took 25 tickets at a time, you can see that that distribution of sample means is definitely not right skew. It's symmetric and it's, it has much less variation. So these two distributions, even though the sample means change in this population, the sample means don't have a distribution that changes anything at all, like the distribution of x, the variable we were starting with. The third fact is that we saw when we plotted these sample means that they ha basically had the same center, but the spread decreased as the sample size increased. So these are the these are the box plots for the sample mean, where I took four tickets, nine tickets, twenty-five tickets, and so on. And what what is this thing here? This this the the, the, the Elizabeth box. What is that called again? What's that? Right. The I the I the I Q R the in the interquartile range. So this is a this is a legitimate um, you know measure of the spread, right? For any distribution. And so you can see that this spread is definitely going down. And the thing is, this really shouldn't surprise anybody. Right? Because what did we say when we talked about sampling? We said two things affect sampling. First of all, the sampling method, right? How does the sampling method affect our estimate? Well, if we're sampling randomly, what should happen is that our estimates should be kind of centered around the bullseye, right? And this bullseye is the parameter, it's the population mean. And you can see, sure enough, that these values are centered around the, the uh, population mean. Okay? And we totally expect that smaller sample sizes we're going to have more variation, right? So we totally expect that for smaller samples, the sample means to have a greater spread. But we also said the other thing that's important in sampling is the sample size, right? What happens as a sample size gets larger? Not even thinking about activity three, what did we know from the past? Our estimates should get what? More. More precise, that's the word. That's precise in the word, right? So the idea is that we're still clustered around the same value, but that cluster becomes a lot tighter, okay? And that's, that's exactly what's going on. You can see that really clearly, right? All of 
put all of the uh, sample means, the mean sample size are clustered around the same value, but the cusp can be kind of like a sample size. This is just an illustration of what we already know. Now here's something we don't know. And this is one of the nice surprises about this activity. Notice that as the sample size gets larger, right? So these are the sample means. This is x bar, not x. These are the sample means, the following sample means, when I put four tickets, nine tickets, 25, and so on. And you can see really clearly, right? This distribution is right skewed. This is right skewed, but not as right skewed as the sample size goes up. When n is equal to 25, I'd really call that slightly right skewed. It's not really strong right skewed. And finally, when I put the 100 tickets, notice that those sample means, they're basically connected, right? And so, when we wanted to get a better read on that, what did we do? What is, what is this plot right here? QQ plot, right? And what's the purpose of the QQ plot? How do I, how do I read this? Like, how would, how would I interpret this plot right here? The red line is, is the, what you want. I can't think of the word for it, but you want the data points to go across the other line for it to be a normal plot. Right, that's what I'm looking for. If it's if it's normal, right? If the, if the distribution is normal, these 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 points, these these blue data points, should be really close to this red horizontal line. And here you can see they aren't. Right, there's a systematic deviation. There's a consistent deviation. That's not normal. Notice that as the sample size goes up, it becomes more normal. There's deviations and deviations become smaller. Right. When you go to 25, again, it's a little bit of deviation, but less. You can see that it's getting closer and closer to that line. Is there ever a time when you can have a large sample size and not have a scale effect? Well, there, could there be like a scale effect? It, uh, so it, it depends. If it's, if, if, it's, um, if it's really strongly skewed, so this kind of goes to, a, to an, an important point. So there's, there's, there's kind of two things that you want to know about, about this. The first is that, so we'll call this x and x bar. So if the distribution of x is right skewed, then for small sample sizes, x bar will be right skewed. And, and you can see that in this case, right? That the, the, the ticket sales themselves, all the ticket sales, strongly right skewed. Okay. Guess what? If it's if it if it's left skewed, if the variable's left skewed, what do you think x bar is going to be? Left skewed, right? Big surprise. Now the now one of the questions we're going to be wrestling with is kind of well, how how large a sample size do you need, or is it possible that you can get some weird distribution that no matter how large a sample size is, it's still not normal. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that. So let me ask you a quick question. Um, how many people found that when they had a sample size of nine, they had a, a normal distribution? Anybody? Did anybody find that? Anyone? What about 25? Did anyone find that the sample size of 25 they had a normal distribution? Nobody? You guys did? Yeah. Yes. When you computed your p-value, what did you Oh, get? the p-value, no. But from like just the, I mean the histogram looked uh, normal, but then the p-value was a little bit. And sometimes that happens. That's why we have varying degrees of test, right? First you plot, plot the histogram. This guy is like not even worth running the test, right? But this guy is a 25, and we might want to run it. Because actually the QQ plot looks pretty good. But if I run that, I'm going to find that plot more. So most of you found out that you had to go to a sample size of 100. But there may have been some people, it's not that, not, not that uncommon that you might find a sample size of how 25 works. So this kind of raises an interesting question, which is, you know, how, how big of a sample size do we need? So we're going to discuss this. So here's, here's kind of the three, here's kind of the, like, the, like the four main takeaways, okay, from activity three. First of all, the plot of the variable and the sample mean are not the same. They don't have the same distribution. That's really important. <laughs> Secondly, as the sample size increases, we see a couple of things with the, with the sample means plot. First of all, we see that the center doesn't change. 
All that's changing is the width is just de decreasing. And the distribution is also changing, right? It's becoming more and more normal. So these are, these are really important to track. So any questions about that part of activity three? That one was pretty good? Okay. So it just kind of raises some questions. So here's the questions you want to look at today. So what we're, what, we're, what, what we're kind of saying is that for a large enough sample size, x bar is normal. But Todd brought up a really good question, which is, well, how large a sample size do you actually need to be normal? Okay. And you know the other questions that we, we kind of want to pin down, although we think we know the answers right now, is first of all, what is the mean? Well, we kind of think that's the population mean, right? But what is the standard deviation? All we know about it right now is that it goes down as a sample size goes up. But how? We, we think in our mind there should be some sort of mathematical law. There should be some sort of relationship, right, between the standard deviation of the sample means and the sample size. So we want to try to investigate that too. So now we're going to actually talk about what the distribution of a sample mean looks like. And so the first thing we're going to do is we have to introduce a little bit of terminology. So first of all, notice that we're always making this distinction between the variable and the sample mean. We actually have different notations, right? So we use x for the variable, we use x bar for the sample mean. But we're going to make another distinction now. So because the distribution of the variable and the sample mean are not the same, we're all totally convinced of that, right? We're going to actually give the distribution for the sample mean its own name. So we're going to, we're going to call the distribution of x bar the sampling distribution for the sample mean. It's going to have its own name now. And generally, we're not going to use all those words. Okay, the reason why the book uses it is you notice that you can play the same sort of game with other sorts of estimators. For example, if I wanted to look at the sample standard deviation instead of the sample mean, I could do the same thing, couldn't I? I could have taken samples, and now instead of computing the mean, I could compute the standard deviation. And I could see what the distribution of the sample standard deviation would be. So we don't have to be doing this just for the mean. Unfortunately, we're not going to have time to do this. We want to do that next to my fourth my, my fourth ball talk. We, 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 we talk all about that. But right now, we're just going to limit ourselves to the mean. So we're just going to cut this short. We're just going to call it the sample distribution. So this question we asked, okay, of, of how large a sample size has to be. So here's kind of the second take home from this: is that the more skewed the actual distribution is the larger the sample size will be for x bar the normal. So this is kind of the uh, second fact here. So you can think of this as the as the first fact, okay? And second fact is that the more the more skewed x is. the larger the sample size has to be. For x bar to be normal. And you can prove all of this mathematically. We're not going to do that, but you can actually show that. Now, you know, one, one question is, well, you know, how big does it have to be? And it really depends upon how skewed the distribution is. When the distribution is nice and it's symmetric, actually the sample size doesn't even matter. You can almost take any sort of sample size you want. But if we take around 25 to 30, we're always guaranteed we're going to be okay. All right. When it's skewed, we have to use slightly larger samples. So we might, we might want to use 30 to 50. When it's strongly skewed, then we have to use really large sample size, 50 to 100. And you might say, well, those are really crappy guidelines, right? 50 to 100 is like a huge range. How do I know which to use? And the thing we want to understand is that these are just guidelines. They're not rules. A lot of times people try to interpret things as guidelines or rules. So I've, I've used this example before, but I'll just bring this analogy up again. These guidelines are a lot like the way people play golf. So you know, if you're playing golf, 
you hit a ball near the green. I've never seen anyone in my life take something that measures the distance from the ball to the pin, and then they take a little chart. Okay, let's see, I'm six yards away, I should be at nine on it. Nobody does that, right? They kind of use their own judgment. Same sort of thing is true here. When do we use 50 and when do we use 100? It depends on how important normality is. So we haven't discussed this yet, but we're going to be talking about hypothesis tests. And for some of the hypothesis tests, you have to make sure that you have a, a normal distribution. It's really important. So when being normal is really important, we're going, to use, we're going to make sure that we err on this side. Most of the work we're going to do, it's really not going to be that big a deal. So we're going to be computing confidence intervals and stuff like that. Their normality is not such a big deal. So we can kind of use a uh, uh, smaller stuff like that. So if we ask this question, you know, what is the, what is the uh, mean of uh, the, the uh, sample means? Okay, if you kind of look at this, although it's a little hard to see because it's so close, you know, this is actually the sample mean. It's this green thing with this little plus right at the bottom. And you can see basically that this is almost right on top of the population. And so if you look at the values, you can see this also, right? You can see that the, the ticket sales <coughs> is 319, right? And you can see that the sample means for all of the different sample sizes is really close. So one thing to kind of be careful about, some people look at these values and they might disagree. They might say, no, I think you're, I think you're wrong because um, 317 is actually pretty far away from 319. How would you argue that's not true? Why can I say all these values are kind of crazy? You're looking at the relative, right? The relative difference. In other words, if I have one dollar and you have six dollars, we differ by five dollars, but the difference is huge. If I have a five a million dollars and you have a million and five, we still differ by five, right? But the relative difference, right? The difference divided by the actual value is really small. So we would say that these things are all basically the same. So now we can come out and say what we've been wanting to say the whole time, which is that the mean of the sample means. It sounds kind of strange, but that's what it is, right? The mean of all the sample means is actually equal to the population of the So notice that the distribution of x bar and x have some differences, but they have some similarities. They both have the same mean, okay? So we, so we know the answer to that. Now, what we don't know the answer to, and this is actually tricky, is what is the standard deviation of x bar? And so I'm going to introduce a little bit of notation here, okay? So remember that sigma means the population standard deviation, right? That little subscript means I'm taking the population standard deviation of x bar. And that n is referring to the sample size. So it's kind of like a function. And so here's, here's the two things that we think should be true. We think that as a sample size goes up, the spread of the sample mean should go down, the variability should go down, the standard deviation should go down. We also think that as, if you have a random variable that has more spread, so as the data set itself has more spread, the sample mean should have more spread, right? And so it turns out that if you actually go through the mathematics, okay, you can show that the standard deviation of the sample means is equal to the standard deviation of x divided by the square root of the sample size. And this is probably the most important um, equation in this entire class, maybe outside the least of the This is a really important equation. And if I wanted to write it in my strictly math notation, I could write it like this. Same, same thing. And this is this is this is not so obvious. Okay, this actually took quite some time for people to figure out. So just to convince you, this isn't a figment of my crazy imagination. All right. Here's, here's some results from, from my uh, version of activity three. Notice that these are the sample sizes, and these are the standard deviations of the sample mean. And I plotted them here as dots, okay? So when n is equal to four, the sample standard deviation is 115, it's right up there, and so on. And this curve right here 
is actually what, what, what the theory predicts. This is the population standard deviation, which is 226 divided by the standard deviation. So you see what the theory predicts is right on top of what we actually see. So it, it gives us a little bit of confidence, right, in what we're doing. But you can prove it mathematically. So here's kind of the final answer to this question. Well, what is the distribution of the sample means? So here's what we can say. We can say that for any population in law, it doesn't matter what it looks like, what the distribution is like. If I take a big enough sample size, I can say that the sample mean looks like it comes from a normal distribution. The mean is going to be the same as the population mean, and the standard deviation of the sample means is going to be the standard deviation of the variable divided by the square root of the sample size. Or if we want to write this in a kind of compact form, that's our notation here. And this is arguably the most important statement in all of statistics. This is called the central limit theorem. And it's called the central limit theorem for a reason. It's literally at the center of every single thing we're going to be doing. I can tell you that when I was a student, I didn't really understand it. Now, I got an A in the course, I could draw all the I's and cross all the T's and put down what the teacher wanted me to know. I didn't really get this concept. And it wasn't until I was out working with engineers, I finally understood it. And first I thought to myself, wow, I'm such an idiot. This is the whole point of this, of this, this statistics I didn't understand. The most important thing I didn't get, I thought, you know, I'm never going to tell anyone I was this dumb, you know. Then I started working with, with, with engineers, these guys had master's degrees, and they didn't understand it either. Then I realized, guess what? This isn't that easy to understand. This is the hardest concept in this whole, whole class. Something else I'll tell you. When I understood this idea, everything I learned in statistics instantly made sense. Everything crystallized. At that point, I said, I, I totally dropped everything that we did. It's that, it's that important. So this is something that's really worth meditating on, really worth thinking about. And it's not easy. It really takes some time to get down. So just to kind of just to kind of rehash this really quick. So this is what the central limit theorem says now. It says that if you have a large enough sample, the sample means have a normal distribution, their means the same as the population mean, and their standard deviation is smaller, right? Standard deviation of the variable divided by the square root of n. One thing I'm going to say really quick. So some of the problems on the homework call this the standard error. That's not correct. That isn't the standard error. So when they're talking about the standard error, they're referring to this. But technically, it's not correct. Okay. So just just so you know. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and take a break. When we come back, we're going to see how to actually apply this stuff. And so if you want to go to uh, the homework problems, okay, we're going to come back and, and work on some of those after the break. Oh no, yeah. If we were doing like, if you guys had like the same group over and over again, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. probably not a bad idea, but there's only so many hours in a day. You know, no, I, yeah. not a great idea.
Since Nick is not here, you get the duties of Rana starting off the roll and we begin. All right, why don't we start back in? Okay, so uh, I'm going to cover these problems. We're going to spend a little bit of time on them because really thinking about these problems are extremely really important. A lot of the problems we're going to start to do are really word problems. So we want to start to learn how to break down these problems and think about them. Okay, so 
this is actually really a very, this is what I would consider like a, an underhand thrust. This is a really easy problem. But let's just break it down first. So how does one calculate the standard deviation of the sampling interval? So here's what they're thinking. They're thinking that, here's what you know. <coughs> you know rho, I'm sorry, you know sigma. What does, what does sigma stand for again? Um, which one? Population. Good. So how do so how do we remember Greek? This is a Greek letter, right? It's all it's all Greek to us, right? Meaning we don't know it. We don't know the population standard deviation. So this is the population standard deviation. Okay. Um, N is going to be the, the the sample size we, that we take, right? And mu is the population mean. So that's what they're kind of starting off that we assume we know. Okay, so how does one calculate the standard deviation of the sample mean? Um, here's, here's what I want to do. I want to try to rewrite each of these um, options in terms of these symbols, okay? So we're going to say that sigma x bar n is equal to the population standard deviation <coughs> of x bar. Notice I should be a little careful, shouldn't I? Probably not a bad idea to say x, even though it's implied. All right? For a sample size equal to n. Okay, let's try to kind of morph this. So for A, so here's, here's how we're going to do this. We're going to say that the population standard deviation of X bar for a sample size of N is equal to, so for A it says divide the population standard deviation by the sample size. How, how would I write that in terms of those symbols? How would I do that? By the population standard deviation by the sample size, what do you think? Um, Close. It doesn't say square root, so it'll just be n? Oh, and you guys, did you have, you have a different one? You probably have a different one, right? So I'm referring to mine, okay? Okay, so this, this is what it's saying, right? The population standard deviation divided by the sample size, okay? Let's go ahead and try to write B in terms of the symbols. Divide the square root of the sample size by the population standard deviation. How would I, how would I write that? I know that. So here's the thing. Let's, let's take ordinary language, let's morph it into symbols, right? So it says what? It says, how should I write this? The, the divide the square root of the sample size by the population standard deviation. So it should be this, right? I want to take the sample size, and I'm going to take the square root. So this is the square root. I'm going to divide this by the population standard deviation. How would I write that now in symbols? It'd be square root n over. Over sigma? Yeah. I agree. OK. Uh, let's see, what about C? We're on, a, we're, we're on a roll. Multiply the population standard deviation by the square root of the sample size. How would I do that? Let's see. Go ahead. I'm not really sure. Okay, so let's think about it. So I'm, I'm multiplying two things, right? One's the population standard deviation. What's the symbol for that? Uh, circle. Sigma? Yeah. yeah. Sigma. It's kind of, like a, kind, kind of like a lazy six, right? And I'm and I'm I'm multiplying it by what? So this is this is for C, right? So multiply the population standard deviation, that's sigma, right? By what? By the sample size or square root of the sample size, right? So how would I write that? I'm multiplying it by the square root. And what's the symbol for sample size? N. N. Uh, even on a Sunday. Okay. 
n is always reserved for sample size, okay, in this sort of context, so regardless of the problem. All right, last one. Uh, divide the population standard deviation by the square root of the sample size. So what's that going to be? What do you think? Multiply the population by the... D, D, D. So you want to divide the population standard deviation by the square root of the sample size. How would I write that in symbols now? Sigma divided by square root of... Bingo. All right, good. So these are our three possibilities. Which one's correct, actually? What did we say? We said that for the sample mean, what's the correct formula for the, for the, the, the standard deviation? Any, any answers? D? I agree, D. And so I, I, I mentioned this last last class, but I'll mention this again. This was not a fact that was well known. So people used to think it was actually this. For, for a long time, people thought it was this. And there's a, there's a story we told about gold in England and all that sort of stuff, right? And so this is, this is kind of an interesting topic. Any questions on this part? Everyone's good? Okay. And let's just check to make sure. Drum roll. <laughs> and there we go. All right. Is this this problem is actually a little harder? Yeah. Notice that everything about the problem is in single sentence, right? But the recorded for we can survey the population distribution of number of years of educated and self-employed individuals in a certain region has a mean of thirteen point three and a standard deviation of three point eight. All right, and wants to know what is the variable. All right. Any ideas? The number of years. So we have one vote for the number of years of education. Everybody agree? Yeah. yeah. How do we know that's the right answer? So here's something you want to do. Notice that when you read this problem, we're going to go back to what we learned in the very beginning about context. Okay? So we want to start to try to put things in context. What, who, and why, right? So the so the the what? Um, it was uh, it was a survey. We don't know how many people were in the survey, right? The why they're not telling us. I, I'm sorry. The who we don't know. It's just a, according to a recent survey, right? So we don't know that, but why do we don't know? But the what we know. So how we how we know that it's number of years is this phrase right here. Population distribution. Whenever I'm talking about a distribution, I'm talking about a variable. It's really important to understand. That, that's kind of what a variable means. It means you don't have a single value. You have a bunch of values, right? They form a distribution. So it's a population distribution of, and then number of years of education. And the rest is just really describing, right, who they were, who they were sampling, right? So this is the this is the what? This is the this is the variable. Okay. The key part is number of years of education. That's what they're actually writing down, right? The rest is just describing the people who were in the sample. So it should be number of years of education. <coughs> Question? I'm, I'm sorry. They are those numbers true? That I don't know. Because we, we wouldn't even know how it was true or not. They could say in a certain region, right? So yeah, in this case, we would have a little bit no. OK, so it should be number of years of education. Let's see. Yes. The mean of the sampling distribution of size 100. Huh. What is the sampling distribution? I can't talk about the mean until I know what the sampling distribution is. Right? What is the sampling distribution? In, in today's notes. Is it even talking about? And I'm, I'm going to let you guys find it, OK? So you know, you 
You're going to do the heavy lifting. I'm just a spotter, all right? What is the, what is the sampling distribution? It's not a number, it's a it's it's a thing. Is that not the sample score? So, so, so we want to know what is the sampling distribution? What is it the distribution is of? <coughs> it's a something, right? It's like one. The sample mean? So this is the this is the distribution of the of the sample mean. Or as it's affectionately known, x bar. All right. So we want to know what is the mean of the sampling distribution when we take a hundred a size of a sample size of a hundred. What should that be? What do you think? <laughs> so we know that the we actually know what the sample what this this distribution is right. We have a large n. Maybe we have you know n is equal to a hundred. So this tells us a few things. The central limit theorem tells us three things right. It says that x bar has a normal distribution. Its mean is the same as the mean of the random variable, and its standard deviation is this. And so we're actually given this, right? This is the mean of x. This is the mean of our variable. And we're, we're given that. So in my problem, the mean is what? 13.3, right? So I know what, I know what that's going to be. So let's see. Go ahead and give that a try. No, that's a, no, that's that's the beautiful thing. There are some, some there are some similarities and differences. So one of the one of the similarities is that the sample mean has the same mean as the actual variable, and it's a little it's a little weird to talk about because you're talking about the mean of the sample mean. It seems kind of weird. Okay. So we want to interpret this. So of these possibilities. Which ones do we automatically rule out, do you think? Sure. Because if you think about it for a second, okay, the, the uh, <coughs> uh, mean here is the mean of all the sample means. It's normal. It's just right in the middle, right? So if you kind of think about what's going on in this problem, this is the distribution of x bar, right? So 13.3 in my problem sits right in the middle. So it's certainly not an extreme value. It's not the smallest, right, of the, of the sample means. It's not the largest. It's right in the middle. We can definitely rule out C and D. What about A and B? They kind of look similar. Right? The one has the term mean, so it must be the correct answer. Right? So why don't you like this this one when you have against B? So you, so you have to be really careful. So what the, the interpretation of this is, this is saying that every sample, all samples have this mean. All samples are size 100. And we know that's totally false. So it has to be A. The expected value is the same thing as the mean, but even if you didn't know that, just by a process of elimination, right? We could figure that out. 
Is, is it, does everyone understand why it's A and not and not B? So I'm going through these for a reason, right? Because guess what the homework's going to look like? It's going to look like this. So if you have questions, now's the time for honesty, right? Everybody's good? All right. What is the standard deviation of x of x bar? So what will my what what will it be for my for my problem? The standard deviation of x bar. What should it be equal to? <coughs> Sure, that sounds that sounds reasonable. So because we know the formula is standard deviation of x divided by the square root of the sample size. And so we're given that this is 3 and our sample size is 100. So it's going to be 0 0.3. Is the standard deviation of x bar always less than the standard deviation of x? So we should get 0.3 here. Let's see, we want the correct description of the standard deviation for x bar. Which one can we roll out here? Yeah, it's, it's kind of it's kind of a trick one, the same as the last last one. Okay, so this is a statement that says, you know, 0 0.3 is the standard deviation of all samples of size 100. We know that's false. Two others we can kind of rule out for the same reason, right? Which are those? What do you think, Jonathan? What is what is the standard deviation actually? Does anyone remember? We talked about a long time ago. It's related to the distance from the mean. What is it? It's the nature of the spread. But we can be a little more precise than that, actually. Does anyone remember? So the standard deviation, we, we kind of actually had a nice interpretation for the standard deviation. It was what? It's the average distance. Of the, of the data values from the mean, right? So we know that this can't be true. It can't be the maximum deviation, the average deviation, okay? It can't be the minimum. So the only one left is this. And we know the standard deviation is, in fact, a measure of variability, right? It's a, it's a measure of the width. So it must be D. All right. So what if we change the sample size? Now we have a sample size of 400. What's the what's the mean of the sample mean size? It's the same. It could be anything. 1, 2, 5, 100, 2,000, doesn't matter, right? Sample means all the, the, the mean of the sample means is always the same. It's the same as the population mean of X. Good. But the standard deviation is going to change, right? So when the, when the sample size goes up to 400, so if, if, if you kind of think about what's going on, okay, um, and we look at, uh, we, could, we could make a little chart here. Okay, so, so when, when, when n is equal to 100, right, the mean here is 13.3. The standard deviation was 3 divided by the square root of 100, right, or 3 over 10. When the sample size is 400, the mean is always the same, right? It doesn't matter what the sample size is. So the sample size is, is not important. It's the same for all sample sizes. 
but the standard deviation is going to change, right? So this is 0.3, and when all the mathematical smoke clears, that's going to be 0.15. Okay. The sample size only changes the shape, and it only changes the width. It doesn't, doesn't affect the center. And let's just check and make sure. And we're good. So what happens to the mean of the sampling of the sampling distribution as the sample size increases? As the sample size increases, the mean of the distribution of x bar it should get smaller, right? It stays the same. That's what we just said, right? So the mean of the sampling distribution is totally unaffected by the by the sample size. All right, good. What about the standard deviation of the sampling distribution? <coughs> it's going to be decreasing, right? So the sample size increases, standard deviation of x bar decreases. Good. All right. So let me ask you a question. What what problems do we have? What what about the sampling distribution is difficult? <coughs> Right, so we're going to spend a lot of time talking about this, okay? How, how do we do work from? And that's, that, takes, that takes a little bit of time. That's a skill, okay? Um, as, far as, the, as far as the equations, the only, the only equation you really have to know is just the standard deviation of x bar, right? That's the only equation that works for us, okay? Other, other, other questions we have? Nothing else is difficult? No, the notation's okay. Everyone still with the notation? Okay. I'll tell you what, we're going to stop here for today, and uh, we'll pick up on Tuesday and finish up the problems. If you want to work ahead and try them and see what difficulties you're having, probably not a bad idea.